In 2006, a book came out called Same Kind of Different as Me. Maybe some of you have read it. It's a book written by Ron Hall and Denver Moore. The book is set in Fort Worth, Texas. And the main place that the setting is is Union Mission Gospel, which I've thankfully had the opportunity to serve at before. It's an amazing place. But the story is about two different people from two different sides of the tracks, so to speak. Ron and Deborah Hall are white. Ron is chasing after the American dream. His job makes him associate with rich people all the time. And that's his goal in life, is to be like them. It becomes a real struggle for him and his wife in their marriage so much that he ends up having an affair. Now, his wife is a deeply committed Christian. And as part of their reconciliation, she volunteers both of them <laughs> to go serve at the Union Gospel Mission. He goes, and it's there that they meet a man by the name of Denver Moore. Now, Denver Moore is very different. He's black. He grew up a sharecropper in the South. No education. And on the streets of Fort Worth, he's got a reputation. But he goes to the Union Gospel Mission to get some food. And it's there that these two lives from two very different worlds intersect. And so the book is about the story of God taking two people from two very different worlds and how their relationship is molded and how God changes both of their hearts through that relationship. We're going to look at the prophet Amos today, if you want to turn there. And I think Amos' message to us today is very poignant. It's pretty amazing when you talk to many Christian organizations about their fight for justice. They quote the prophet Amos. And so in God's providence, he would have us in this book on the week of such a monumental occasion with the Supreme Court. So what I want us to do is to dive into Amos, starting in the first chapter. We're going to look at the background briefly before we dive into the substance of his letter. In Amos 1.1, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. In chapter 7, beginning in verse 14, we learn a little bit more about the prophet Amos. It says, Then Amos answered and said to Amos, I, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from the following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to Israel. Amos' name means burden bearer. And as we look at his letter as his prophecy to Israel, we're going to see that he carried quite a burden that he was delivering to the people. As we look at the story of Amos, it tells us he was a shepherd and he was an arborist. He worked with trees. He was a member of the lowest class. He had no clout. A shepherd, someone that works with trees, you're on the low end of the totem pole. That's who Amos was. As we look at our map that we've been talking about, we remember Israel is the northern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom. Now, Amos was from Judah, but he traveled to Israel to give them this prophecy. Now, Israel didn't appreciate this low-class shepherd coming to talk to them. 
Now, the question I have for you guys is, when somebody comes and talks to you that maybe isn't in the same social category, are you willing to listen? Or do you have this defense mechanism as they're not able to talk to me, what do they know? That's what Amos was facing when he went to Israel. They said, you're just a shepherd. What do you know? Over the last couple years, we've heard this cry. We've heard this cry, particularly from the black church in America. That has cried out to the white church and said, help us. Help us. How do we react when we hear that? Do we say, you know what, that's your problem? Or do we say, hey, you're just being woke, or whatever the terms are that we want to use? Or do we listen with compassion? Do we care when someone who's different than us comes and gives us a message that maybe we don't want to hear? That's what Amos does. That's what a lot of people are doing today. They're saying stuff that we just don't want to hear. But I think the book of Amos is telling us, hey, we better open our ears and we better listen. On our timeline, we see that Amos prophesied around 760 B.C. Based on the kings that he tells us. The story can also be found in 2 Kings chapter 14 verses 23 through chapter 15 verses 7. It's kind of the time frame that Amos talks in. Now under Jeroboam the second, Israel was going through a season of great prosperity. They were rich. They had great military power. They had a lot of success in the world. But as we've talked about with some of the other prophets, that also led to great pride and it led to great idolatry. And through this, even though they had all this, God was not pleased with them. And there's one particular area that Amos points out that God is particularly unhappy with them about. And it's how they treat the poor. Israel anticipates a day of judgment. We talked about it. Jonathan talked about it when he was talking about Joel, the day of the Lord. It's a running theme throughout many of the prophets. Israel thought that the day of the Lord was going to be a great day. They said, God's blessed us. We're rich. We're comfortable. God's going to bless us on the day of the Lord, and he's going to condemn all of our enemies. He's going to crush them. But what we see is that the day of the Lord was coming for Israel as well. That they weren't safe. And so that is the story. In 722, not just a few decades after Amos prophesies, the Assyrians would come in and destroy Israel and would take them captive. Now you may remember if you've been here over the weeks, throughout the prophets... There's a typical pattern that we see. The first stage of the pattern is that God says to Israel or to Judah that you've sinned and you've broken our covenant and you need to repent. And then the second pattern is God saying, you Israel or you Judah, you're not repenting. And so judgment's going to come. And then the third stage of the pattern is that God says... I want to give you hope. I want to let you know that you will be judged. You will be condemned. But on the backside of it, there's hope for you if you will repent. If you will learn from your mistakes and you will repent. And we're going to see this pattern throughout Amos. Now in verse 2, Amos is going to give us kind of the text of kind of the atmosphere around this whole letter. He says, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. Now for us today, 
the sound of a roar is not very terrifying because the only time you probably will ever see a lion is at a zoo behind a big gate, right? You don't have to worry about it. But when Amos was riding, the lion was the most feared thing in the whole world. If you heard a lion roar, then you knew he was about to go kill something. That's what lions do. They roar, then they kill. And so Amos is telling the people of Israel that the Lord is like a lion who's ready to kill and destroy. And that's what he jumps into in verses 3 of chapter 1 through chapter 2, verses 5. God's going to declare judgment on six different nations that surround Israel. And then also Judah, God's people in the southern kingdom. He's going to talk about their judgment. Each time in these seven conversations, Amos is going to use a phrase. It's going to be three transgressions and for four. And this is a poetic way of Amos saying, you guys have sinned a whole lot. You're in a lot of trouble. If we look at verse 6 of chapter 1, this is just one of them, but I wanted to read it to you. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because they carried into exile a whole people... To deliver them up to Edom. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it shall devour her strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants of Ashdod, and him who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnants of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord. Now, these six surrounding countries, minus Judah, there was a common thread. Amongst east of the judgments. And that common thread is that they had sinned by cruelty and violence toward other people. In particularly, taking people into slavery. To all six of these countries had been cruel to people. They had been violent to people. They had taken them captive and put them into slavery. You may remember last week when we talked about Obadiah, and he specifically condemned the nation of Edom. And one of their big sins was that when Israel was attacked, they took fleeing refugees from Israel and they put them into slavery. This is what we see. But then in chapter 2, verses 4, we see God is going to turn his attention to Judah. Judah's God's people, but they're not friends with Israel. And so he says, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes, but their lies have led them astray. Those after which their fathers walked. So I will send a fire upon Judah. And it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Judah's primary sins were turning away from God's law and idolatry. God said all of these nations had sinned greatly. And every single one of them, he's going to destroy with fire. Now, Israel's hearing these pronouncements. Amos has come in as the stranger, as the shepherd. And he starts going, okay, we're going to get him and him and him, all these surrounding countries that had been mean to Israel. Can you imagine what they're thinking? They're like, go, 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 Amos. Like, they think he's like their best bud now. Like, they're like ready to build a statue for Amos, right? How often... Do we cheer over bad news about people we don't like? Whether it's a political party, whether it's a religion, 
whether it's a government entity, maybe it's a social entity. How many times do we cheer when we start seeing bad news where you check out the news or you check out social media and you're like, they're getting what's deserved. And we're like, go, go, go. Right? Even some of you may like not want to let anybody know. You might be like, go, 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 behind closed doors, right? Right? I mean, over the last couple of days, how many of us have been like, go, 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 right? What about if instead of the rah, 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 we, were like, we wept? What if we wept over the evil instead of cheering their destruction? What would that look like? Because in verse 6 of chapter 2, the rah, rah, rahs are about to end. In verse 6, thus says the Lord. So all of a sudden we have this crowd jumping up and down cheering. And that, that cheer is about to go silent. For three transgressions of Israel and for four. I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted, a man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. See, Israel was no different than every other country. They had rich people and they had poor people. Every country has that. But the difference is God had commanded his people to take care of the poor. These other countries... They didn't hear from God. They were not God's people, but Israel was. And God had specifically told them, you need to care for the poor. But instead, they chose to abuse the poor. And God hates that. Part of the idol worship that they had embraced, we see, was sexual sin. We see that fathers and sons were sleeping with the same temple prostitutes. Garments taken in pledge. These were blankets that poor people used to cover themselves in the cold desert nights of Israel. But what had happened was the rich people had taken those garments as part of the loan that they had given poor people. A poor person would go to a rich people and say, I need to borrow some money. And they say, sure, I'll give you some money, but here's the interest. And it's going to be exorbitant, and I need your blanket. So now the poor person owes a ton of money, which he can't repay, and they've taken his only shelter. And not only has he taken his only shelter, but they've taken it to the temples of these false gods, and they use those blankets to lay on as they drink their wine and celebrate their paganism. And in verse 13, God's going to tell them that instead of fire... I'm going to crush you like an animal in the road and a heavy built cart runs right over it. I'm going to crush you. If you've ever seen an animal laying in the highway or on the side of the highway that's been hit by a car, that's what God's going to do to these people. He's going to crush them because of their sin. In chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, hear this word from the Lord. He has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So out of all the people of the earth, God chose Israel. He chose them, not because they were better. They're clearly not. All you have to do is read through the history of Israel to know they're not better. But he chose them for a purpose. And because of that purpose and because of God's choosing, 
Israel had greater responsibilities. God has chosen you, the church. If you are a Christian, God has chosen you. And you have greater responsibilities. You don't get to be like everyone else. God has called us to a different standard. I think many times in our lives, we don't think about that. We don't think about how God has literally called us to be set apart, to be different. And I think we need to be reminded of that. I think it's important that we understand and we think about how God has called us in our neighborhoods, in our work, in our schools. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be the outcast because we act differently. We talk differently. We think differently. We love differently. That's what we're supposed to do. But unfortunately, Israel didn't. And so God had to punish them. In chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, Amos is going to give them six questions that all have an obvious answer. And those six questions are going to build up to the final question, which once again has an obvious answer, but the people need to hear it. He said, do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? No, obviously they don't. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? No, it doesn't. Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? No, he doesn't. Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth? When there is no trap for it. No, it doesn't. Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? No, it doesn't. Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? No. When a trumpet's blown in a city, people are afraid because that means somebody's attacking. Does disaster come to a city? Unless the Lord has done it. No, it doesn't. Amos wanted the people of Israel to know that God is in ultimate control. That the destruction that is coming to them is coming from God directly. He will use the Assyrians, but it's coming from God. He wants them to know that. And that he cannot allow their sin to go unpunished. So the question today for us is, do we have a holy fear of God? Do we understand that God does demand obedience? It isn't a God that says, hey, you know what? I would love it if you would obey me, but if you don't, cool. It's a God that demands obedience. In chapters 5 and 6, Amos is going to dive in to God's ultimate condemnation of Israel in this letter. And it is their treatment of the poor by the rich. In chapter 5, beginning in verse 11, it says, Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, for I know how many of your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate... Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. It was a very evil time. Bribery, riches, those had led to unequal justice in Israel. We see this today in our country, don't we? There are two different streams of justice in our country. There is a stream for the rich and there's a stream for the poor. It doesn't take anybody to be a rocket scientist to see this. We see it every day in how people are judged. We need to be different. We as the church need to stand up for justice in our court systems. We need to demand equal justice 
for the rich and for the poor. We can't just sit back and go, you know what? They're rich so they can afford to get off. And the poor person can't. We have to change. In verse 18 of chapter 5, he continues, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? Is it darkness and not night? As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? And gloom with no brightness in it. I hate I despise your feast, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. See, the nation of Israel thought that the day of the Lord was going to be a great day. They thought, my enemies are going to get it. He's going to get all these countries. He's even going to get Judah. But that's not what God had. God was going to bring the judgment on Israel. You see, God's not looking for their gifts. He's not looking for their riches. He's not looking for their sacrifices. What he's looking for is justice for the poor. And he's looking for true worship of himself. And Israel was not doing it. In chapter 6, verse 4. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp And like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in the bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds, and I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. You see, God was furious with these rich people. They were drinking wine by the bowl. They were eating the best, choicest meats. They were enjoying their life and didn't care at all about the poor. Didn't care at all. And he said, you rich people, enjoy it now because you will be the first taken in to slavery. You will become the first slaves for the Assyrians. These rich people didn't care about injustice. They didn't care about poverty. They didn't care about the court systems. They didn't care about the corruption All they cared about was themselves. Do we not see this prevalent in our country? Is that not the mindset in our country? What about yourselves? Do you care? Do you really care? In chapter 7, verse 1 through 8, 3... We're going to see four visions that God is going to give to Amos about the coming judgment, about the Assyrians coming. The first was of a swarm of locusts. You might remember from our study in Joel that a swarm of locusts came. Now, Israel was an agricultural country. And so a swarm of locusts would be devastating. And so Amos pleaded with God, please do not send the locusts. It reminds us a lot of Abraham when he pled for Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He said, please don't destroy them if there's this many righteous. Amos pleads for Israel. And God, in his compassion, because he does not want to destroy, relented. In the second vision, 
we see fire. Once again, in an agricultural country, a fire breaks out and it devastates. You might remember that God had promised all the earlier countries that fire was going to be what destroyed them. But once again, Amos pleads to God. He said, please do not destroy our country. And God relented. The third vision is of a wall and a plumb line. Now, a plumb line is a device where you are able to determine the verticality of a wall. Is a wall straight or not? Now, this was important because if your wall is not straight, when you're attacked by an enemy, your wall is going to fall. And so God showed him a vision of a wall in the plumb line, and the wall was very crooked. At this point, Amos says, I can't even, I can't even beg for them. They're too sinful. They're too corrupt. Because the plumb line for Israel is God's law. And they were so far off the map. Their wall was so crooked that Amos was like, I can't even, I can't even plead for him anymore. And then the fourth vision, God shows a basket of ripe fruit. Fruit at the end of the season that was ready for picking. And that represented that Israel's time was ripe. That it, they were now ready to be picked to be destroyed. In chapters, chapter 8, verses 4, through chapter 9, verses 10, once again, God condemns Israel for their treatment of the poor. And this time, he's going to tie it to their ability to even hear his voice. Beginning in verse 4 of chapter 8, Hear this, you who trample on the needy, and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over? When will we be able to sell grain again? And the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephod small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat." The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never again forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account? And everyone who mourns will dwell in it. And all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the mourning for, on, for an only son and end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. See, God's so disgusted by their treatment of the poor that he's going to take away their ability to hear from him. There will be no more prophets sent to Israel to speak God's words to them. What if God took away our ability to hear from him because of the way we treat people? What if he did that? You don't think it'll happen? Look at Europe. You can barely find a church in Europe any days. Most churches are now owned by the government. They're cathedrals. Remembering a day gone by. Here in our country, there are churches shutting down every day. There are pastors in churches that don't deserve the name pastor. Pastor. Because they don't preach the word of God. We need to wake up. Do not think for one second that God will not judge us for our sins as well. Do not think for one second that we have the special relationship that Israel did. We're not Israel. 
We are a sinful nation just like all the other ones. And God has not promised us anything but judgment if we don't turn to him. But our God is a God of hope. In the final four verses, chapter 9, verse 11 through 15, God promises that David's lineage will one day rule a unified Israel again. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnants of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills will flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord their God. You see, when Amos spoke to Israel, it had been 80 years since they had abandoned the Davidic line. Jerusalem was in the south. It was in Judah. And they had set up temples in the north so that they didn't have to go to Jerusalem to worship. They had abandoned the Davidic kingdom for 80 years when Amos spoke. But he says that there will be an heir who will reign over a unified Israel one day. And that day will come when during the millennial reign of Christ, Israel is united, it is back flourishing as a country, and Jesus Christ himself sits on the throne of David and rules over all of Israel. That day's coming. And for us, that is a hope for us. So what can we learn from the prophet Amos? I told you, these prophets, they weren't going to win most popular in school. I think there's four things we can learn from this prophet. The first is, just because you are wealthy, and believe me, everyone sitting in this room is wealthy. Just because you're wealthy does not mean that you're in good standing with God. The people of Israel thought that because they had money... And they were happy that that was a sign that God was happy with them. And he wasn't. Do not let these charlatans fool you to tell you that God's happiness with you is equated to your wealth, your health, or anything else. Your relationship with God is based clearly on Jesus Christ. And your obedience to him flows from your relationship with Jesus Christ. Second... How we treat those less fortunate has a direct correlation to our relationship with God. If you don't treat them well, God is not happy. There is a direct correlation between your relationship with God and how you treat those less fortunate than you. If you want to be arrogant and prideful and look and say, it's not my problem, then God will have a problem with you. Third, just like Dan and Denver built a relationship and it changed their lives, we need to, each one of us, step across the tracks and build relationships with people that we normally wouldn't. We need to be okay to be not okay. We need to be able to say, hey, that person is different than me, but I need to be a relationship with them because God might use them to teach me something that I would not know if I didn't rub shoulders with people that are different than me. Fourth, trust Jesus with your possessions. He's blessed you. Trust him. Have a heart of generosity. Have a heart that is always looking of how can I bless someone else. Don't just live with closed hands. Live our lives with open hands. 
how can we help those that are less fortunate? Now, two major events happened this week. Like I said, in God's providence, he put us in Amos this week for a reason. The first is we had an amazing week at Four Days for Others. We had some amazing adults and students and kids give up their time and their talents to go help people in need this week in our town. And it's amazing. That is an amazing thing. Next year, I want us to have more projects and more people working because there's a lot of people in this town that could use our help. We just have to open our eyes and see it. So thank you to those of you who gave up your time, gave your talents to help this week. It was an amazing. It was amazing. Next year, let's make it bigger. Let's make it bigger. Let's help more people. Second, the Supreme Court made a major decision this week that has caused our country to go up in flames. We as the church have been talking for 50 years about how much we want to stop the murder of children, right? It's a blessing. This is an answer to prayer for 50 years that God would do this. But now it's time for us to step it up. There are people in Crane, there are people in the surrounding areas that are in situations that would classify as crisis. And we at First Baptist Church need to be a solution. We need to be able to give them hope. From the moment they find out they're pregnant to helping them once the baby is here. We need to be able to provide them supplies, to provide them support. If they're in school, they need to be able to continue their schooling because we help them. If they need money, we need to be able to help them financially. If they're in a bad situation, an abusive situation, we need to provide them a solution to get out of it. We can't just talk. It's time for action. And so I'm going to talk with our church leadership and I'm going to talk with our finance. And I want to create a fund that we can do this, that we can help people. I want people to know that if you're a girl and you're pregnant, you can come to First Baptist Church and you're not going to get the side eye. Oh, I can't believe she did that. No. You're going to come and you're going to get hugs. You're going to get love. And you're going to get resources to help you. So I want to let you know to get ready. Because we're about to get on board with this. And that means that some of you are going to have to step out of your comfort zones. That might be somebody having to provide a bedroom for a teenage girl that can't go home. That might be somebody needing to provide some meals. But we've got to. We can't just say it. We've got to do it. And guess what? You know what's about to happen? Is the Texas adoption agencies are about to be flooded. Some of you need to be praying about adoption. Some of you need to be praying about fostering. We can't just say it. we got to do it. We can't just say for 50 years, we've been praying for this to stop. Because it's not going to stop, people, until hearts are changed. Government doesn't change hearts. Government makes rules, but they don't change hearts. We're still going to have babies being born and their mothers can't take care of them. And we have to step up. We can't just say, hey, government, take care of our kids. The church is the one that has to take care of these kids. We have to be about it. This is a justice issue. Because I tell you, most of the ones that have the problems are poor It's not the rich white girls. They can find somebody. It's the poor people. And we have to care. Just like we talked about last week with Obadiah, we got to care. We can't just talk. We've got to action. And so I want to encourage you to start praying in your families. How can I be an advocate? How can I be involved in this? How can I help? Not just sit on the sidelines and say, hey, somebody else will do it. It doesn't matter how old you are, where you are in life, you can be an advocate. You can help. 
You can provide your time. You can provide your love. You can provide your resources. doesn't matter who you are. You can help. Because God cares about these kids. God cares about these girls. They're not just a statistic to God. He cares deeply about them. And if you want to see people give their lives to Jesus, show them love. And when they ask you, why? No one else loves me. Why do you love me? Because Jesus loved me first. That's why I love you. That's why I care for you. That's why I don't just care about the baby before it's born, but I care about the baby once it's born. How can I help the mom find a job if she needs a job? How can I help her with transportation if she needs transportation to get to a job? How can we be a part of it? How can we be different than what everybody else is? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the times in your word where you are you're brutal. You challenge us to live beyond what we think we can live. And the only reason we can do it is because of you. The only reason we can do this, the only reason we can love like this is because Jesus loved us and he changed us. And so we want to live that out. And so, Lord, I pray that as we continue this time of singing and worshiping you, that you would, you would speak to us each individually about how we can be involved in justice, in caring for the poor, for believing people that maybe we don't associate with when they say, hey, we're hurting and we need your help. And we don't just say, well, I don't really believe them. They're just making it up. But we actually bring it in and we say, okay, I, I love these people and I need to listen and I need to care. Take away our pride. Take away our arrogance. And help us to be humble servants of you. Because that is where we need to be. In Jesus' name, amen.